what a way to begin a meeting. Thank you all for being here tonight. At this time, we're going to sing the national anthem. If you will, Bob. and start to get this country back in shape again. So we want you to see all of the candidates. We want you to hear from all of the candidates uh, so that you can make the best decision. Now, every candidate that you hear and see tonight is a Republican because we're going through a nomination process. Our job is to pick out the candidate that can beat the heavily financed Democrat that they're going to have to run against. So uh, we have to work really, really hard to make sure we get the very best candidates out there uh, that we know are going to win this election this year. Uh, it's kind of funny as we talk about all of this. As you know, our club has been heavily involved in election, in election integrity. 
And uh, it's uh, interesting, as you look at election integrity, as to what's going on right now uh, up in Washington with this H.R. 1 bill, uh, uh, what's really interesting, I had one of our members uh, show me some uh, literature the other day that I thought was very, very revealing. But uh, back 16 years ago in, in 2005, uh, we had, we actually had a bipartisan commission uh, led by Carter, Jimmy Carter uh, from the Democrats and Jimmy Baker on behalf of the Republicans. And they actually did come together and come to some serious conclusions. One is that we had to have election integrity and voter ID was at the centerpiece of that forum. So uh, that information came out. Uh, it's interesting to note that there are 47 countries in the United States that, that are, not, not the United States, excuse me, in the world, that run democratic free elections like we do. And of that, we are the outlier. Uh, England in 2004 determined that they couldn't have paper ballots because paper ballots led to too much fraud. France, prior to that, came to the, sec the same conclusion. So they've eliminated paper ballots. All of the other countries have eliminated paper ballots uh, except for the absentee ballot where you have to file and send in your information and they mail you the ballot. So that's all been done. Now we have a party that is trying to bring all that back again. One more interesting note, Canada does not allow paper ballots. They have the voter ID and Mexico, Mexico, which we all know all the problems that they have had with elections down there, uh, went on and recently uh, uh, instituted a firm voter ID rule where you not only have to have a picture ID, but you also have to have a fingerprint ID to vote. And, and guess what happened? Because you know, you hear all this about voter suppression. What happened in Mexico is that they achieved the highest rate of voter participation ever. So uh, that, I, I thought you should know that. Okay, well, lastly, uh, uh, we uh, wanted to just, I wanted to just mention that we have launched our new uh, Club Express website. And I know there's a few wrinkles that we've had to work out. You've had to work it out. We've had to work it out. Uh, but in spite of that, once again, you're all here tonight. And I think, I uh, hope you got the dinner that you ordered and all that worked out for you. Now, uh, we have uh, one piece of business that has to be done tonight, unfortunately, and before we start our program. And that is we have uh, four new officers uh, or, or that, have, that have been elected, that you have elected, and they need to officially be sworn in. So we've asked our dear friend, uh, the Justice of the Peace, Judge Raleigh, if he would do the swearing in. And I would ask those board members to please come forward, if you will. So uh, Clayton, and where's Ron? Where's Ron? And... Uh, no, Diane's not here, but, uh, oh, here's Joan, okay. Joan, I didn't see you. <laughs> yeah. So I uh, am pleased to introduce to you uh, our, our, one of our dear friends, uh, Judge Paul Raleigh, uh, who is the Justice of the Peace, and he's going to swear these three candidates in here. Thank you, Jack. I think the best, uh, by the way, good evening, everybody. I'm Judge Raleigh. Thank you for the opportunity. I think the easiest way for me to do this is to ask you to raise your right hand, and then I'll say uh, the oath, and when I'm through, you'll say, I do. So if you would please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that you will faithfully execute the duties to which you were elected or appointed by the Republican Club at Heritage Ranch and will, to the best of your ability, preserve, protect, and defend this organization's bylaws 
um, as well as the regulatory rules that may be imposed by federal, state, or local law. So help you God. Congratulations. Okay, now uh, we are very, uh, very blessed to have with us tonight uh, your elected officials and your candidates for uh, the uh, position that are available. So I'd like to ask them to come out and introduce themselves to you so you know who they are. You've got a name with a face here. How'd I do? Pretty good, huh? No. Hey, don't forget to can you hear me? Hi, I'm Lynn Finley. I'm your Collin County District Clerk, and I am running for re-election, and I would appreciate your vote in March. I also wanted to say that your County Clerk, Stacey Kemp, was not able to be here this evening. She is ill, but she really did want to be here, so she's also on the ballot in March. We would appreciate your vote. Thank you. Hi y'all, I'm Candy Noble and I'm honored to serve you in the Texas House. Hard act to follow. Ken Logston, Prairie Ranch resident, and uh, I serve on the Fairview Town Council of C C5. Good afternoon, my name is Sammy App. I'm Constable of Precinct 3. I'm here to also represent Matt Carpenter. He has COVID positive, he couldn't make it. He's running for Precinct 1 Constable. Thank you. Happy New Year, Heritage Ranch. Good to see y'all. Uh, my name is Sandra Lesnar. I'm your mayor, and I am not up for re election this year. I got to get another year out of this. So. Good evening, everyone. I'm Greg Custer, and I'm uh, your town council member in C2, and I am up for re-election this coming year. And I'm Sue Reeves, and I'm honored to serve as your precinct chair, but that's not why I'm here. I'm actually honored to introduce to you tonight our county judge. Chris Hill is not feeling well tonight. He sends his regards, and also Angela Paxton, our senator is speaking in Plano tonight, and she is working hard to keep our future free. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Heritage Ranch, for having us. My name is Lee Finley, and I'm running for Collin County Judge. Dr. Matt Rostami, I'm an eye surgeon running for Texas State Senate District 8. My goal is to grow out our party demographically. I would appreciate your vote. Thank you. I'm Debbie Lytle. I'm running for District Clerk, and I have 16 years of records management experience, and I would love to use that experience for you. Good evening, I'm Maggie Witt. I am your State Republican Executive Committee Woman for SDA, that's Angela Paxton's district. I am planning on running again this summer if you're a delegate at the Houston Convention. I would very much appreciate your vote. Thank you. Good evening, I am Jimmy Angelino. I am running for judge of Collin County Court of Law number five and I would appreciate your vote. I'm making sure I follow the rules. Good evening, my name is Randy Johnson. I am also running for Collin County Court at Law Number Five. Judge, thank you all for your time, for letting us speak to you, and I hope to earn your vote. Thank you. Cindy Mayfield, I'm running for Justice of the Peace, Precinct 1. Look forward to giving your vote. If you have any questions, I'll be at table 13. Thank you. I'm Jim Pickle. Some of you might remember me. Uh, I am now your committee man for uh, State Republican Executive Committee for SD8. So if you have any questions, I'm the liaison between the grassroots and the Republican Party. Let me know, okay? Thank you. 
Hi, everybody. Uh, I just got here and put me in this line, so. <laughs> no, I really did just get here. I'm Judge Tom Novak. I'm your judge of the 366th District Court here in Collin County. And I am running for re-election. I did just get here because we just finished a trial in our court. Uh, so I am a little late. I didn't get to hang out with y'all. Where's table eight? Where's your hand? Lex, they put me in the corner. Um, all right. We are working for you down at the courthouse. Uh, I just want y'all to know the trials are still going on. We're doing all that for you guys, uh, making sure that uh, county business is taken care of. Uh, so I appreciate your vote. I appreciate your time. God bless y'all. And have a great day. And you're Hi right, folks, I'm Judge Crawley, your Justice of the Peace. I've been for the last 24 years, and I'd like to stay your Justice of the Peace. Please re-elect me. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, my name is Ricky Williams. I'm running for Congress in Congressional District 3, and I'll be right over there after dinner. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is John Hood, and I'll be running for Fairview Town Council seat six, and I appreciate your vote. Thank you. Hello, I'm Kobe Owen. I'm running for Constable Collin County Precinct 1, born raised here in Collin County, 24 years of experience in law enforcement. She told me to keep it short, so uh, I'll be up here next week in the debate. Thank you. Uh, ben Brown, please come forward. Uh, would would y'all please stand for mutication and for a moment of silence? Uh, some of you know Greg Chior for a number of years. He passed recently, one of our club members, and we want to have a moment of silence before our invocation. Heavenly Father, it's a new year and a new beginning, a new life, a new energy. We thank you for everybody that's here tonight. All the excitement about the upcoming campaigns and, and all the people involved, we, we thank you for the efforts. We thank you for the candidates that are running. We ask you to give them health, give them wisdom as they press their races, and give us wisdom to discern who to vote for. Thank you tonight for the food, blessed and the nourishment of our bodies. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. And you may be seated and join us. To get it. <laughs> because we are ready to begin in a, as soon as everything gets quieted down. And I'd like to ask the candidates who are in the forum number one to come up, uh, oh, to come over there, that's right. And Jane will meet you and you will come and sit down. While they are getting organized, I'd like to say a few words. And actually, I'd rather be on the floor, but there's no room on the floor, so they put me up here now, so I'm all visible. And I'd rather be hidden. Anyway, let me say this. We are extremely happy that you are here. Trying to put together this event has been challenging. And it's been challenging because the original filing ended in December on the 13th. And then the, the early voting will be February 14th. That's about two months, but guess what? Our beloved Christmas celebrations and New Year we're in the middle. So it's made it very challenging, I'm sure for the candidates, but I am really sure for your Republican club to get it all together because it's hard to reach out for people when they're still reorganizing or organizing their campaign. And then they have other demands and our state is so big, you can't be a peer uh, in say, well, in Dallas at one point, and in Corpus Christi at another. I mean, there's so many miles in between. So sometimes it's hard to really organize. 
And then there's another feature, which was hit today. Because when we thought we had everything ready, two of the people involved in this were not able to come because of a high temperature and having been with people who had COVID. That was just proven that they had a positive test. So, we do what we can, and we hope we provided something for you, knowing that we have to deliver when we say we're going to do something. We've got, we have it all together. It's not perfect, but we hope you will enjoy it, and it is very informative for you. Part of our program is on video, but it's a video that was made especially for you in Heritage Ranch. The first forum will have, as you see, um, Suzanne Harp, she should be coming, <laughs> and Keith Self, and Ricky Williams, and a representative for Van Taylor, who was currently, like today, called to a session in the house. So you can't be two places in one time, so we have an alternative. But um, we are going to have Van Taylor's on video because he did make something especially for you. So what we're going to do first um, is start our program and, and we will, just a moment. who is Brittany Bernard, and she is, did I pronounce your last name correctly? Yes. And she is going to just introduce a video that Representative Van Taylor prepared for you since he could not be here. And we kind of knew that in advance, although we were always hoping that he could appear because, as I understand, our pal Pelosi has a habit of calling and changing her schedule rather at random. At least that's what I understood. So we were hoping the best. Since it is a video, is there any way to have the lights down a little bit so that we can see it clearly? I don't know if that's possible. But before we do the video, I'd like to ask Brittany to say a few words on behalf of the person she represents. Hi everyone, my name is Brittany Brainerd. I'm Congressman Van Taylor's campaign director. It's great to be here with y'all this evening. As Joan mentioned, unfortunately Congress is in session today, so Van couldn't join us in person. Uh, but if anyone has any questions or wants to discuss anything with me after his video message, after the forum, please come find me. I'll be at his candidate table. Appreciate your having me, and thank you for all you do to keep Collin County in Texas red. And the candidate tables, as you know, are in the lobby, and I urge you, and I'll say this again and again, to go by, because all of our candidates have information for you to take with them. So, are you ready uh, with the video? Yes. Hello, Larry Branch. This is Van Taylor. I'm sorry I can't be with you there tonight. I'm in Washington, D.C., fighting for our conservative values. Um, I've had the privilege of knowing many of you for many, many years, and I know we have sat down together many times to relish our conservative victories in the Texas legislature in Washington, D.C. So I'm not going to go into a big, long political speech, but I did want to share with you a few of my thoughts about where we are. Make no mistake, America is at a critical moment in history. Democrats are trying to fundamentally change America, take our liberty, and impose an oversized, centralized federal government on top of us, making decisions for us from cradle to grave. I worked with President Trump to secure our work, 
and I am fighting to bring back those same policies which made us safe. I am one of the only very few members of the United States Congress that has any experience in securing our southern border, experience that Washington desperately needs. I'm fighting against Biden and Pelosi's tax and spend agenda. In fact, the very first piece of legislation I co-sponsored when I came to Congress was the balanced budget amendment to our Constitution. We need good government reforms to get our federal spending under control, just like we did right here in the great state of Texas. And I'm continuing to fight on a lot of other issues, like fighting the unconstitutional COVID decrees, combating CRT, protecting the Second Amendment, protecting the right to life, and the list goes on. For my commitment to fighting for our conservative principles, I am proud to be one of six members of the U.S. House to have a perfect rating from Heritage Action over the last two terms, as well as an A rating from National Right to Life, the NRA, and many other trusted conservative organizations. In our campaign for Congress, I am honored to receive endorsements from many conservative leaders, including our own U.S. Senator, Ted Cruz, Texas Right to Life, the Texas Homeschool Coalition, and the Trump Administration alumni, um, Congressman Bonnie Jackson, and former Texas Governor and Trump Energy Secretary, Rick Perry. But the most important endorsement of all is your endorsement. And to that end, I want to give you my personal cell phone number, 214-642-0920. Call me here anytime. I would love to hear from you. 214-642-0920. Thank you so much for your support and your friendship. And again, I'm sorry I was not there in person. I hope to see you soon. 2022, we're going to make America great again and fire Nancy Pelosi. God bless. So the next uh, person that you'll hear from is a person who was supposed to be here. We even have his name tag. And it was actually three o'clock that I heard he has a high temperature. So of course, what do you think I said? Come on, you really have to get here? No. So he is not here, and that is Jeremy Ivanovsky. And so we have a written uh, message to you which John is going to read. And let me stress something. You know, this is democracy in action. We have the great pr privilege of bringing to you at least a message, if not in person, which these fine people are doing, uh, to tell why they want to be in the seat of the representative. We do not have a debate. The candidates were told without question not to refer to their opponents. We want to hear why they are best suited and who they are. So we trust that we will keep it very, very objective. That's what we stand for in this club. And we're trying to help you decide who best reflects your, uh, your perspective and what's important to you. That's why we try so hard, and believe me, it's really hard to get in touch with these candidates and bring them over here if it's at all possible. So please cooperate. We, we appreciate all of them for even wanting to run, let alone, you know, commit making this strong commitment. So um, without hesitating anymore, John's going to read a message from Jeremy Ivanovsky. Thank you. A short biography. Dallas born, Plano raised, I'm a true son of Texas. I'm also a second generation American whose grandparents survived the ravages of the Third Reich, the Second World War, to ultimately call America their new home to embrace the American dream of freedom. My love of this country's constitution and law and order developed at an early age. Uh, in 1983, Lee Greenwood's God Bless the USA debuted, and I was in kindergarten in Plano, yet realized that at such a young age, the significance of those lyrics uh, that being an American was something profoundly special. 
Later, while attending Plano East Senior High School, I wrote an analysis of George Orwell's 1984, never imagining I would ever be living it. Following high school, I attended UT Arlington, the College, college of Law Enforcement Academy, uh, served as a dispatcher for the city of Plano, Texas, almost three years, fulfilling my civic duty to serve a, uh, his fellow men. I joined the airline in 2000 with the desire to travel and serve. After the 9-11 attacks, I activated my peace officer license and served as a non-paid volunteer reserve deputy constable for well over a decade, growing my law enforcement experience while serving continually in, air, in aviation. Uh, and all with the strongly held belief that hard work is the building block of true character. In the aftermath of the July 7th, 2016 ambush deaths of five heroic police officers in downtown Dallas, I quickly decided to become a full-time municipal police officer as my patriotic duty to protect those who cannot protect themselves. With the rising tide of career politicians, special interest political corruption, and the recent unchallenged assault on our voter laws before an election, I am duty-bound to launch an assault against those who do not have the best interest at heart for the citizens of the great state of Texas or that of the United States of America. The founders of this great republic debated long and hard about the future of this country and the trajectory they felt their bold efforts and energy should take it. The same ideals that the founders fought so hard for and that also brought my grandparents to this country, I have witnessed erode over time. The secularization of society, the removal of God from nearly everyday life, the dissolution of the nuclear family, the decline of self-reliance and resiliency, literal rewriting of our history, a decline in educational standards, moral decay, uncontrolled open borders, assault on our great military from within, just to name a few. While god fearing red, white, and blue-blooded patriotic Americans of all faiths, religions, and creeds unite to take a stand against this tyrannical assault and take down of our great republic, Americans are unstoppable. When patriots, constitutionalists, god fearing warrior sheepdogs come together, the best is yet to come. Would you help me support uh, today to trust your vote? Uh, so would you help support me today and trust your vote is not wasted in Congressional District 3? Regards, Jeremy Ivanikas. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now we're going to begin hearing from the three candidates who are sitting in front of you. We have them according to their sort of alphabetical order of their last name, meaning Suzanne Harp with an H. Uh, Jeremy, of course, is done. <laughs> uh, Keith Self and Ricky Williams. So the way we're going to do this, we have a general question they will be answering. They'll have two minutes to introduce themselves and to tell something about themselves personally and professionally, and perhaps why they want to be in the office. This is not a question, it's a statement introducing who they are. We will begin with Suzanne Hart, but thereafter, in order to be fair, we will have the beginning with number two and number three. We'll keep changing off so that the same person isn't expected to start everything off just like that. So at the uh, 25 seconds before they're due to stop, they'll hear. And when they're due to stop, they will hear. And if they don't stop, I have my weapon. <laughs> and it makes a terrible noise. They don't want that embarrassment. Okay. So I have a nice timekeeper here with me, John Sefcik. And will you begin, please? You're starting. Yes, stand up is better, and you can wander around, but keep the microphone almost in your mouth. That's it, interesting. <laughs> Thank you, Heritage Ranch, for affording us this opportunity. What a privilege it is to run for U.S. Congress to serve Collin and Hunt County. I'm a sixth generation Texan on my mother's side, and my dad came to this country from Athens, Greece, after enduring the Second World War and the tyranny of communism. 
He taught the six of us kids to love and respect this country. He also taught us to be mindful of a government that oversteps its bounds. It is truly sobering to see the gross government overreach that's coming out of Washington today. Like most of you, I'm a God-fearing patriot, and I don't want to be the generation that loses the republic. Over the last year, we have endured a fraudulent election, never-ending unconstitutional mandates, gross government spending, and the total abandonment of our citizens and allies in Afghanistan. What we need is a congresswoman willing to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Nancy Pelosi and the establishment. A congresswoman willing to fight for our liberties and the Constitution. A Washington outsider with a proven track record of solving complex problems. Currently, I am the Vice President of Strategic Accounts for an investment bank where we specialize in mergers and acquisitions. With my background of building business, growing revenue, and, and starting new companies, I know that we have that what it takes to build and support not only this county, but our country. Thank you for that. What I'm most proud of is being married to my husband for 27 years and raising our four kids and homeschooling right here in Collin County. I'll bring solutions to our border, to energy independence, and making sure we bring government spending back under control. I would love for you to trust me with your vote, and I promise you one thing. If you send me to Washington, I will not disappoint you. Thank you. Well, hello, Heritage Ranch. It's good to see you again. Uh, my name is Keith Self. Most of you know me as the county judge for 12 years. I left office about three years ago. But I'm going to start before that. Uh, I left Texas to go to West Point and uh, graduated from West Point and became an airborne infantryman and then a Special Forces Green Beret. I've uh, been, over, been in combat zones from Grenada to Afghanistan to the Gulf for Iraq. Uh, I've served overseas with my wife, Tracy, of 46 years for a decade in places like the Pentagon, uh, Egypt, the Embassy in Egypt, the U.S. European Command, working on both sides of the Palestinian-Israeli uh, conflict. And then I retired from the Army and came home to uh, Colin Cat, came home to Texas. Uh, in 06, I ran for the county judge, and since then, we lowered your tax rate to the lowest in the state. Uh, we passed legislation, thank you, yes. Uh, we passed legislation to normalize state law with federal law so that, Ill, so that our immigrants do not qualify for health care until they have indeed worked for 40 quarters. Uh, we, we were the first county to put our checkbook online and a transparency move for you. Uh, you. You should be looking for somebody with a proven record. And I've got a proven record to be a conservative. Um, I don't just talk about being conservative. I've been a conservative all of my life and I've proved it right here in Collin County for 12 years. I tell you what, uh, if you want somebody to go and stand toe to toe with the people up there, you're gonna need somebody that knows how to do it. I think I'm your man. I appreciate your vote. I ask for your vote, and I ask for your support. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Ricky Williams, and I am not a politician. I am an educator. My wife, Tammy, and I, we have three sons. The two oldest have already graduated from college and our youngest is in middle school, and we have two grandchildren. I'm the product of a working class family, and I began working from the time I was in the second grade. I'm a first generation college student, and I worked in the oil fields of North Louisiana to put myself through school. I began my career in education as a teacher and a football coach before moving up to athletic director, a high school principal, and school superintendent. I currently work at the second largest educational service center in the state of Texas, where we serve over 900,000 students. And, I, and I've been there for the last 14 years. What led me ultimately to run for Congress is that I wanted my children to know that their dad will stand up for this country and stand up against the Marxists in Washington, D.C as well as the Republican rhino establishment in Washington, D.C. as well. 
I want them to know that their dad will do that for them and this country. You know, I've seen firsthand the destruction that the federal government can do to our children through poisonous ideology like critical race theory and programs of racial discrimination disguised as diversity, <laughs> equity, and inclusion. We know that the future of our country is in the hands of our children and our grandchildren. And I want my children to be proud of this country and to understand the freedoms guaranteed in our Constitution. So patriots, I need your help. I need your help to work with me and put a true educator in Congress. Thank you very much. The candidates were just given a question of the copy of the questions and I will I will read the question. The only reason I didn't I thought it would be more efficient if they would have it in front of them because they could kind of refer. Some people are more visual than auditory and whatever your learning uh, style is, we accommodate. So the first question and they will have a very short period to answer, they were given certain topics that we would explore, that we would ask the questions about. They were not given the questions. So the first question is somewhat loaded. They all are. <laughs> the first one is border security, immigration policy, and fentanyl deaths are three major issues intertwined at the Texas southern border. What is your approach to resolving these intertwining issues? And the first person will be Keith Self. Uh, that's a great question, that, and they are intertwined. Uh, first of all, the border security is we must close the southern border. But first of all, let me explain why they're intertwined. Uh, fentanyl deaths are the precursor chemicals are, are manufactured in China. They come to Mexico and most of the uh, fentanyl comes across the southern border uh, in an illegal way, just like we have the illegal immigrants across the southern border. So that's how they're intertwined. Uh, border security, we have got to def uh, declare the cartels as foreign terrorist organizations. Then we go after their money, which we know how to do because we've been doing it for 20 years against the Islamic terrorists. Uh, we've got to convince Mexico that they are invested in this. And that may take some pain in American people for a short time. We may have to close the border to all commercial traffic so that they start paying attention and they start helping us because we've got to get their help. Uh, and I say at the end of the day, build a wall. Build two walls if we have to. They'll be ugly, but walls work. I will tell you, they work in Israel, they work in North Korea. Build a wall, build two walls, put patrols between them. Uh, Okay, very good. And now the immigration policy, they said immigration policy, that's both illegal immigration and legal immigration, and a lot of work needs to be done on both of them, but illegal immigration, we have got to use the, uh, uh, stop using posse comitatus to say we can't operate on an international border and send the military, whether it be the Texas National Guard, whether it be the Texas National Guard operated under Title 10, close the border, thank you. I'm afraid they have to speak very quickly. Uh, but the first ding means 25 seconds more, so don't stop. And um, just get ready for delivering. I realize it's short. I wish we had a lot more time, but we know people need to leave when they need to leave. And I don't want them to go out the door until you're done, right? Okay. All right. The next person is Ricky Williams. Thank you. He I say build four walls. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> no, so uh, obviously the border is a big issue for us. And obviously we do need to finish that wall that Trump started. Uh, but this is about two things. This is about national security. This is also about public safety. Now my wife and I 
And we don't need to go to the border for photo ops. We've lived in South Texas. We have friends and family that still live in tax, uh, South Texas. And so we get a uh, report from South Texas all the time. Uh, we, have, we hear stories from our friends and neighbors down in that area who will see a, a marauding group of illegal aliens coming across their property. And the very day prior, their children were playing in that very same area. We hear reports of cars being stopped and crashed and 10 to 15 people will bail out of those cars uh, and take off in 15 uh, different directions. So yes, we need a border uh, that is, is secure for national security purposes, but also public safety. And we need to hold, the very first thing we need to do when we get in Congress, or when I get in Congress, is number one, join the House Freedom Caucus, and number two, impeach Joe Biden for not enforcing our border security laws. Thank you. Thank you. Just take a breath. <laughs> okay. Are you good? Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Um, yes, I think we absolutely should build the wall. We should hold the cartel responsible by declaring them as terrorists. We absolutely should do all those things. But let me ask you a question, because this is what I've been thinking about a lot lately. I'm really overdone with executive orders. I'm done with President Trump doing it the right way and then Biden doing it the wrong way. I think we as legislators need to insist we do it the right way this time and handle it through a legislative process. But one other thing I'd be remiss if I didn't bring it up to you. See, my daughter works for a company called Zero Trafficking. And when we're talking about the little girls and little boys, and yes, little girls and little boys that are trafficked across that, those front lines, those are human beings. And I, a lot of you guys will remember, whenever we were fighting a civil war here, England was over there, and they were handling their slavery much different. There was a man named William Wilberforce. And you know how he stopped slavery in England? He showed all of the aristocrats what slavery smelled like. That means he got them on the ships, he used to sell them across the canal. They would cover their nose and say, what does that smell? He said, that's the smell of slavery. It's the onus upon each and every one of us to understand that that border wall is so important so that we can once and for all stop human trafficking as it's coming across our borders. It's in our county. Collin and Hunt County are the two largest counties for human trafficking. And if we don't stop it for anything else, if the fentanyl isn't bad enough, it's affecting us. It's those little kids. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is, Congress, including Republicans and Democrats, continues to overspend beyond its tax receipts. What will you do to get control of federal spending? And how can the US government reach a balanced bu budget? Yes. Ricky Williams. You know, how sad is it that we've got Democrats and Republicans that can't balance a budget? We all balance our own budget. I've been a school superintendent and handled millions of dollars every single year, and it's not a very hard process. I was a high school algebra teacher. A budget is plus and minus. It's adding and subtracting. It's not deep thinking calculus. It's not deep thinking algebra either. Uh, it's a very simple process. You don't spend more than you bring in. We don't do that in our home, and we shouldn't as a government. We don't in the state of Texas, and we need to have a balance of budget amendment uh, to hold our, not only Democrats, but Republicans accountable for not overspending. We see the effects of that. We see the, the, uh, we see the effects of this uh, inflation this hidden tax that, that we're all paying more for? Why is that? Because the Biden administration, and so have Republicans, have overspent. It's not a hard process. Don't spend more than you bring in. Thank you. Yes. So I've had the great privilege of being a part of many startups. One of them failed. And you don't learn anything better than you do from failure. And I'll tell you the reason why it failed is because we didn't balance our budget. Unfortunately, I wasn't in charge of that. I brought in over a million dollars that year, but it didn't matter. So of course we need to balance our budget. 
I'll remind you, in 1984, Reagan said something. And he wanted to start what was called the Grace Commission. And this is what I think is the answer for us. The Grace Commission was put forth to say, if you did not balance your budget by 2020, you'd be in trillions of dollars of debt. They were behind a couple. Now we're in $30 trillion worth of debt. So this is the solution, because everybody's going to stand up and say, yes, we need to balance a budget. But what does the Grace Commission look like? The Grace Commission would be put forth business leaders from across the United States who would go line item through our budgets and see where the waste is. You say, Reagan said we had one third of our budget was wasteful spending. If it's that way in 1984, I promise you it's that way today. I promise you there is opportunity and there, in every line item. And what I'd like to tell somebody is in that corruption that we see in Washington right now, there's a lot of money to be made. And that's why it still goes on today. So that's what I would like to see. That's the solution, I believe, for it. Of course, Congress would still have oversight and be able to um, either vote for it or not vote for it. But at least that way, you and I could see where the waste is and hold them accountable. Thank you. Thank you. A couple of figures just to get started. First of all, the last time that Congress balanced a budget, I'm sorry, went through the entire budget process, 1996, 25 years ago was the last time they used the budget process before 1 October. Secondly, every time you hear a trillion dollars, given the division of the families in America, that's $10,000 for your family. So the debt of today, 29 trillion, that means your family is on the hook for $290,000. But frankly, that's not us. That's our kids, that's our grandkids. Uh, we have got to stop baseline budgeting is the primary reason that we will be able to start. Now, I will tell you how hard that is, though, because this inflation that we're seeing today, our debt payments are going to skyrocket, which means we're going to be cutting into the non-discretionary funding, such as the Department of Defense. So this will be very difficult. If we stop the baseline budgeting, we can start to cut it down, though, because baseline budgeting basically says you get everything you spent last year plus whatever, 8%, 10%. We must stop that. Stop the bleeding is the first thing we've got to do. Thank you. The third question. The executive department is overreaching into areas such as illegal vaccine mandates, the packing of the Supreme Court. What can you do to stop this and other executive department overreach attempts? Ricky Williams, you're on first. <coughs> Am I right? No. Oh, excuse me. No worries, no worries. Yeah, so our presidents, again, they love the executive orders. And I'm, again, I'm really tired of our lives being feeling like ping pongs from right to left, whether it be Democrat or Republican. We need to go back to the real work of legislative work, of doing the hard work of winning hearts and minds. We don't have a problem with reaching across the aisle. We have a problem with not standing up for our values. We have a problem with not holding presidents accountable. We have a problem with not saying enough is enough. You know, when Biden came into office, just for example, I'd love to bring this up. With one stroke of the pen, he XL the XL Keystone Pipeline, killing 11,000 jobs and 60,000 indirectly. That's taking away $2.2 billion worth of wages for American people. I just don't think an American president was ever supposed to have that kind of power. And if, if I was there, and if, you know, to join the Freedom Caucus or to whatever else it is, but there are a lot of other Republicans that aren't even a part of those caucuses that are just, just as disgusted with that line of work. Thank you. Thank you. Every department, every independent branch uh, overreaches. Uh, the way we will stop this is sunshine has a great impact. We need to hear a voice from the con Congress person, man or woman, from CD3. We need to hear it loud. We need to hear it clear. 
we need to hear a message that will say this does not represent the 766,000 people in Congressional District 3. And I won't be a part of it. And I will be as loud as I can. And I will do what I can to shine sunshine on this problem. Because this is not right by the US Constitution. Thank you. I do feel like that both uh, Democrats and Republicans have overused the executive orders, but I think Biden has gone beyond uh, using executive orders. He's using the federal uh, branches of the of the government, uh, such as using the CDC uh, to uh, to re to allow renters to not pay their rent. Uh, he's used OSHA uh, to enforce uh, vaccine mandates. He is overreached in those areas, and I think if we don't, as Republicans, stand up against that every single day and fight back against that, then these rogue administrations, like we have these illegal rogue administrations, like the Biden administration, will keep doing this to us. Uh, so I would say that we need to uh, encourage uh, and stop the Biden administration from executing these orders and using those different agencies to encroach on our liberties. Thank you. The fourth question, what are your suggestions for the January 6th commission? We all know that it exists and <laughs> it probably is not doing what we would like it to do. That's an understatement. But what are the, your suggestions in going forward for the January 6th commission? Resign. <laughs> and if, and if that doesn't happen, uh, we need to insist that they abide by their very, the documents that uh, supposedly put them in place. Uh, we know that uh, historically these commissions have, are balanced. They may not be totally balanced, but they are more balanced than they are. Uh, so we are not going to get, and if you're looking for this commission to give you anything close to a fair analysis of anything, get over it. They're not going to. So there is no solution for the January 6th commission except on November the 2nd, I think it is, of this year, and in January of next year, we change the House of Representatives to a Republican majority. It's the only answer. Thank you. You know, the January 6th Commission is the first commission that we have a commission in the House and not the Senate. So let that sink in for just a minute. My son was there on January 6th when the riots took place. And I don't even really call them riots. He was in the Cannon Building that day, and he was texting with me back and forth. And he said to me, I said, you know, Blake, stay in your office. He says, Mom, I don't see really a problem. I said, I can see Antifa in that office. I can see Antifa coming through. You see, we paid attention to the summer of love, right? And if you want to have a commission about something, shouldn't Congress be worried about the billions of dollars of those small business owners that their lives were upended? Shouldn't Congress care a little bit about the police officers that were murdered? Shouldn't Congress care a little bit? So for me, I would say kill it immediately, right? I, I, we have no business going there at all. So the answer again is the election. The answer is to make sure we don't let these kind of people have power again over us. Thank you. The January 6th Commission is a political prosecution. It is, is a persecution. We know it and we've seen it. Uh, the fact that we cannot have representatives of, of the Republican Party on the commission. Jim Jordan was kicked off the commission. Liz Cheney was added to, to the commission. But the question is, is what suggestions uh, would we make for the commission? And that is to stop it, cut it out. Uh, it, we've got a, uh, I would suggest that Nancy Pelosi release the videos of inside the Capitol. Uh, show those videos. Uh, release the transcripts from Nancy Pelosi's office to the Capitol Police. What was being said back and forth. That would be what I would be suggesting. If I was on the House floor, I would, I would be demanding that Nancy Pelosi 
released those videos showing what really took place in the Capitol and released the transcripts of what took place from her office to the Capitol Police. That, that's what I'll be doing. And just like he said, and, and Suzanne said as well, uh, until, we can re until we get a, a majority in the House, uh, there's, real, there's very little that we can do. But when we do get that majority, then we can truly investigate really what transpired on January 6th. Thank you. We are going to go into one more question, and it will be on number six on your sheet. But I'm not going to read the whole thing, except the education and the energy departments are huge, poorly run, functioning, or non-functioning, poorly functioning bureaucracies. The Department of Education has seen significant declines in education and has promoted dangerous ideas such as the 1619 project and the CRT training. The Energy Commission or department has not functioned either as it was supposed to. So, as a representative, what would you propose for these Departments and you begin, Ricky, because I think it got a little mixed up before. Got a little long chart here, you okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to focus on the education department because that's right down my alley. So, Ronald Reagan uh, inherited an education department uh, that was implemented by Jimmy Carter. Uh, he vowed to do away with the education department because it was not needed. The more departments uh, and secretaries that we have in Washington, we have more and more. Uh, federal spending and more bloating and more federal, more federal control. Uh, what I've seen in my time in education, from uh, from from the very beginning, from when George W. Bush took the Texas miracle uh, to Washington D.C. and we got no child left behind, we have seen an encroachment into our classrooms at the state level, not only from the state level but across this nation. And we have seen more and more federal control uh, in our nation's schools. And one of the things I've been talking about over and over is we've got to get the federal government out of our classrooms. We've got, to, we've got to have the federal government stop telling our teachers what to do in our classrooms and leave the control of our schools to our local school board. We know good and well that the best decisions for our children are made closest to that child. And that is the parent and the child and the teacher and that child. So we must, and I will always insist that when I get to Washington, D.C., I can promise you this, I will work every single day to reduce the effect that the Department of Education has on our schools uh, and our children and to get the federal government out of our nation's classrooms. Thank you. So Bill and I homeschooled our four children here in Collin County because of these school systems. And we have pretty good school systems compared to nationally. But we wanted to teach about Jesus. We didn't want to have the government telling us what to do. And it wasn't, it, that was another uh, you know, debacle of the, of the Carter administration to bring on the Department of Education. If I had my wish list, I'd get rid of it in a second. But then I might take it a step further. All the colleges that push CRT to our future teachers and want to teach the 1619 project, I think you should defund those colleges until they are willing to teach pro-America education. Number two, the energy department is also a hot mess. And so we need to we need to renegotiate through legislation the XL Keystone Pipeline and bring those jobs back to America. Because you see, um, Canada didn't stop producing petroleum. They just cut us out of the deal. And, and as a businesswoman, I can tell you these things can be renegotiated. They were unhappy with us. Just like the people who were building our wall were unhappy when we decided that we weren't going to uphold our contract. So they still got their money, by the way, but we didn't get our wall. Do you see how this is going? It's like a theme with this administration. Thank you. This is an opportunity for us to go back to the enumerated powers in the Constitution. <laughs> Neither one of these departments is enumerated in the U.S. Constitution. Uh, if you are going to uh, admit that they're going to be here for a while, 
uh, then return as much of the power to the states as possible. The federal government stopped picking winners and losers because that's what the federal government does. It picks winners and losers. And it, it, um, we talk about free markets, but there are very few free markets left because of the federal fingerprints on every single market. So my first option would be to look at the U.S. Constitution. Uh, let me tell you, when you're talking about doing away with departments, I, one of my sayings is courage is contagious. And politics is a team sport. We need to go find as many conservatives as we can find to stand alongside us to make these changes. So first of all, go back to the Constitution. Then you need to get the federal government to re devolve power back to the states uh, in both of these areas. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our final part of this forum, forum excuse me, is to have a final appeal from each candidate. You should be getting your appeal ready while I'm giving you a chance here. And uh, so it will only be one minute, but it is to be a persuasive appeal from each candidate. And since we got a little twisted up in there, I'd like to ask Suzanne to start again. <laughs> one Thank minute. You. Thank you. So one year ago today, we had a fraudulent election. And then we had the January 6th commission. And then we had Liz Cheney confirm not once, but, um, sorry, come up for a vote of no confidence, not once, but twice. And I did not feel like we had the representation that we needed to represent Collin County. So all the years that I spent homeschooling our kids, we learned about the Constitution, but we would take the philosophers against the Bible and we'd say, can somebody in America rewrite this again today? And we thought that that probably wasn't going to be the case. So as I'm sitting there with my homeschool moms and we're debating on how to solve the world, and the, after January happened, we reunited again, and they said, Suzanne, it's time for you to think about this. It's time for you to think about representing Collin County. And that's why I'm before you today, because I'm one of you, I'm a product of Collin County. Like I said, we raised our four children here. I was born in Dallas, graduated from Bertner High School, and when I go to Washington, I'm not going to leave you. Thank you. I am running to restore the conservative legacy in CD3 that we enjoyed under Sam Johnson for decades. There are two things that I will work on first. The first one is the border. We must close the border for our kids, for our drug trade to cut it off, uh, for the human trafficking that I don't use, it's sex trafficking. The second is election integrity. Uh, we must, those two are existential threats to our republic. Our republic is a self-governing body, and if we don't get a handle on those two, the border and election integrity, uh, we will have lost our self-governing capability, losing our republic. Thank you very much. I'm running for Congress to give a conservative voice back to Congressional District 3. You know, this election is too important right now. We have an illegal, illegitimate, rogue president in the, in the office right now, and we need a Republican who will stand up to him every single day. What I'm asking you to do is to vet the candidates. Vet me, vet Keith, vet Suzanne, vet Van Taylor again, uh, vet Jeremy. <coughs> Look at the resume, look at the accomplishment. Do they really have accomplishments? Have they really done what they said that they have done? Don't take our word for it. Challenge me, challenge all of us. Make sure that we're not sending a rhino back to Congress or, or an opportunist to Congress. Look at what we're doing and look at our achievements. And, 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 then, and then make your own determination. But let's send somebody to Washington, D.C. that is your voice. Somebody that will stand up for you every single day and work against those Marxists that are now in control of our country. Thank you.
I'd like to thank all of the three candidates that are here, and certainly um, Brittany Bernard, representing uh, Representative Van Taylor, and uh, our um, Bill Jeremy Avanaskis, um, for at least coming forward and willing to serve us. And it's up to us to look at this very carefully. Now granted, a couple of minutes sharing with the candidates isn't really enough. So look at their websites. Try to, in, try to dig into what they represent, what they've done, what have they been able to do, what has caused them not to do what maybe we would like them to do. So it's up to you. You're, we are the voters. But thank you all very, very much, and all the best in whatever life may bring to you. Thank you. Well, they be, oh, one other thing, they do have a table. And I know when you arrived, it was hard to go to that side of the foyer and pick up anything, but now um, you have an opportunity. And I ask you all to stay in the room and listen to the two, we have two short videos of the two people who are running for the Texas Supreme Court. A very important place. Would those two representatives come on up here, please? Jim Pickle and Toby Young. You can come up to this side. And I want to say that it only has brought before us the importance of the judicial department of government, the judicial branch. And certainly the Texas Supreme Court is part of the judicial branch. And it's really important. These two uh, candidates represented here are both Republicans, as Jack said. But we do have to get the best we can get because no matter what, in November, we are going to do a killing in getting all those Republicans in office. And we're starting right tonight. So, we have on the one side, on my side, yes. Well, we don't have the Jim Pickles because that was a quick one. So I'm sorry. He's representing. Okay, what happened, we knew that that Evan, it is Evan, not even, Evan Young, Justice Evan Young, who is the current sitting justice in the Supreme Court, we knew that he couldn't make it, and Toby Young graciously agreed to come. So she is going to introduce the video. On the other hand, David Shank, who's visited here a few times, he was planning to come and then he couldn't. So he arranged to have Chris Cradle come. Well, lo and behold, I got a message today, along with Jeremy Ivanovsky, and he was unable to come because of COVID, because he was with some people who were positive. So obviously he couldn't. And Jim Pickle graciously came. He's very acquainted with uh, Justice Shank. And he's going to give a little explanation or, or introduction for his candidate. And Jim Pickle has already introduced himself. He's our representative on the SREC, <laughs> which is the organization in between us, the grassroots, and the Republican Party, if I say this correctly. So he will be first, right? Are you ready? All right, you can stand or sit, probably. As John said, I'm Jim Pickle. I got the call to come here on the way home tonight from work. Um, so I have not seen the video. I've not spoken to Justice Shank. Uh, I do have a copy of his resume right here. I'm thinking that a lot of his, his video will be about his qualifications. So I want to talk a little bit more personally about what I know about uh, Justice Shank. He and I ran, I ran to the same court that he's on now in 2018. Of course, we got wiped out by the Beto effect, right? So Justice Shank is now one of two remaining Republicans on the Dallas Court of Appeals. He's fighting literally every day 
against 11 liberal Democrat justices on that court. He's filing dissent after dissent after dissent in his opinions because they are dragging the country to the left and he's fighting back as hard as he can to stop that from happening. He's been on that court for over seven years. No on-the-job training for Justice Shank. He knows what he's doing, okay? He's been involved in multiple cases that went to the U.S. Supreme Court. He graduated first in his class from Baylor Law School, valedictorian, was editor-in-chief of Law Review, he's published seven Law Review articles, and I know a lot of really smart, intelligent, accomplished, rich people from my career. And I will say, without any qualification whatsoever, that David Schenck is the smartest man I have ever met in my entire life. He is crazy smart, and crazy qualified, and really wants to go to the Supreme Court and give all of us the benefit of his experience, his intellect, and his conservative values. And so I heartily recommend that David Shank be under your consideration to take his seat on the Texas Supreme Court. Don't just take my word for it, though, because a lot of you don't know me, and to some of you that do know me, I'm not sure that was a real, real great endorsement. Um, but um, he has had a couple of other organizations talk about him, and I'm just going to read these quotes. Texas lawyer. July 2016, five years ago. You know, he'd been on the bench a couple of years. Republican Justice David Shank is arguably the most qualified justice who has ever sat on the Fifth Court of Appeals. I've been practicing in this district for 30 years. That's, that's an understatement. Dallas Morning News. Hey, I got their endorsement, so it's not all bad. Uh, says, Shank is a solid conservative but not an ideologue and quotes former Democrat Party chair acknowledging he is, quote, almost too qualified for the Court of Appeals, unquote. So I'm not the only one who thinks that about him. He's very well loved, he's very well respected, his opinions are rock solid. He deserves to be on the Supreme Court. Thank you. I'm Justice David Shank from the Fifth Court of Appeals. It's such a pleasure to be with you, albeit virtually here tonight. Uh, it was my pleasure to visit with some of you in November and to have the opportunity to work with you in my past election, and I very much appreciate your support. For those of you who don't remember or don't know me, let me introduce myself a little bit. My name is David J. Shank. I have been serving proudly as your justice here on the Fifth Court of Appeals centered in Dallas. We are the largest court of appeals in the state. We represent four million people. And with your help, uh, we have been successful in electing Republicans to that court until very recently. Uh, a little bit about myself. I am proudly married and the father of two children. One just turned 10, the other 11, both in public schools in Dallas at the moment. And I am now a candidate for statewide office for the first time. I am running for Texas Supreme Court, place nine. It is a seat that was vacated by the retirement of Justice Ava Guzman. I had every intention of being here with you tonight, and I really wish I could have been. The challenges of running for statewide office, as I say, are new to me and have me stretched very thin, so unfortunately, I couldn't be there in person tonight. I'm very glad that my good friend and former law partner, Chris Cradiville, the head of the Texas Stipend Office, will be there to speak on my behalf, and my wife, Natasha, is very pleased to have dinner with you this evening. I'm sure they'll be happy to visit with you and to answer any questions that you might have about my candidacy. Now, moving to my professional background, I went to Baylor Law School here in Texas, and I graduated in 1992. And I was very privileged to be first in my law school class, to serve as the editor-in-chief of the school's law review, and upon graduating, to serve as a law clerk to the chief judge of the Fifth Circuit. That's the federal court that sits over uh, Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. Following my time as a law clerk, I went to the term Jones Day in Washington, D.C., and did U.S. Supreme Court work. Following that, two years in Washington. I returned to Texas and went to work with my friends from Baylor at the firm Hughes & Loose, which is no longer with us, and eventually took over as the head of 
the firm's appellate practice. I was then recruited back to Jones Day to run the Texas appellate practice here. I am board certified as an expert in civil appellate law, the one thing that the Texas court has jurisdiction over, and I've handled more appeals than I can count before I eventually left uh, Jones Day as an equity partner to go to work for the Attorney General as Deputy Attorney General for Legal Counsel. In that capacity, I was responsible for six divisions of the office, including opinions, and ultimately, the in-court legal defense of the Texas State Redistricting Plans in the last census cycle. I led that litigation in Texas and Washington, D.C. at the same time in front of three federal judge uh, panels with a one-year-old child in tow, and my wife can tell you all about the adventures of handling that litigation. It was quite illuminating. After leaving the Attorney General's office, I went back to Dallas to work with my good friend Chris Cradiville from Hughes and Loose. Uh, he and a number of my former friends were now at the Dyke of a law firm, and Chris can tell you more about that law firm, but it was a wonderful experience, and I was very pleased to accept the call from Governor Rick Perry to serve as a justice on the Court of Appeals. For those of you who were active in the club back in 2016, you may recall I had a primary opponent in that election. With your help, we prevailed. And then again, I had a general election opponent. With your help, again, I prevailed. Sadly, I am the last Republican to have succeeded in running for office in this the largest court in the state. I have been extremely active in judicial reforms throughout my career in private practice and on the bench. Uh, I believe Ben is very familiar with and can tell you more about uh, the, the articles I pu published in the past proposing structural reforms to the state's appellate courts. Those articles were picked up and proposed as legislation to the, to the Texas legislature in this last cycle, and I'm disappointed that unfortunately we did not ultimately have any successful plan to redistrict the courts of appeals or other judicial reforms. And I believe strongly in a fair, competent, and functional appellate court system. I regret that I don't believe we have that system in place as of yet. For those of you who have followed the court's work, uh, the Fifth Court of Appeals, that is, you may be aware of some of the very difficult decisions I had to confront recently with respect to judicial ethics. I stand by my obligation, I stand by my oath, and I will not negotiate on any of those and most important things. Uh, I believe that the courts have the obligation to assure that everyone who walks before us has the right to, be, to know that the judge is impartial and the judge is going to render a decision in accordance with the Constitution and with the facts and the law and nothing else. The Texas Constitution imposes special obligations on judges with respect to judicial ethics. I will note that I have been proud also not just to serve as a justice on your Court of Appeals for these last few years, but also as chairman of the State Commission on Judicial Conduct, which is responsible for the ethics enforcement on the state's judiciary. I've proposed serious reforms over a considerable period of time that I believe are necessary to improve the ethics and the constitutional adherence of judges to the rule of law as supported by the Constitution. Uh, I'm regretting that we have not yet had a rep representative from our region on the Texas Supreme Court in this century. I aim with your help to change that. And I, I ask for your vote. Voting starts February 14th. Jet, the actual primary election date in for live and in-person voting will be March 1st. Thank you so much again for your friendship, for your support, and for your help. Again, I'm David Shank. I ask for your vote March 1st. Thank you. Now we have our last candidate. I was thinking, I can't say you saved the best for last because it's not fair to He'll go rent. ahead. To rent. No, no, I have something better for you. We saved the sweetest for last. Toby Young. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Thank y'all so much for having me here tonight. It's a real privilege and it's a double privilege because it's my mother's birthday and I was able to come to town and take my mother to dinner. So thank you for having your forum tonight. My brother-in-law is with us. Evan's sister is in Collin County. Our three nephews are here. We're here a lot. I promise you're going to get to know Evan. And I promise you're going to hear a lot about the courts because it's his passion. It's his favorite thing to do. Uh, he sends his very best wishes to you. He's very sorry he couldn't be here. 
you can go on YouTube tomorrow and watch him on the bench. The Supreme Court is meeting for the next three days, democracy in action. Um, very riveting. But I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to tell you about my husband, the man I picked, and I promise, I scrutinized him, I vetted him, you could trust this man. <laughs> Let me tell you a few things about this man. A few reasons I believe Justice Scalia picked him to be his clerk and to learn his judicial philosophies. The reason the governor picked him, out of many qualified candidates, we're very privileged in the state of Texas to have amazing lawyers, but Evan rose to the top. And the reason I picked him, it's very simple. As my daughter might say, there's a million reasons. And yes, of course, one of the reasons I picked him is I got to be forever young, and that's a wonderful thing as a lady. <laughs> but there are more, mostly his faith. Evan is a man of faith. I think the first time he guest preached, he was in high school. We started our own church recently this summer when the doors were shut and our daughter needed to be in a community with others and learning about the Lord. So we started a church. He's guest preacher there. He was guest preacher when he was in Iraq serving at the request of the Attorney General to go there. This is a passion of his. But it doesn't stop at the church. He's used the gifts he has in the law to represent religious liberties groups. He's been quoted extensively by the US Supreme Court on religious liberties. He advocates constantly. He's, he's argued at the US Supreme Court on these issues. He's argued at the Texas Supreme Court. And when some people say, I've practiced there. Evans argued there. I had somebody recently when he argued before going on the bench say, I feel like I just went to church and I'm pretty sure if they passed the plate, even the justices would be tithing right now. <laughs> he is very much into the advocacy and this passion. The second thing I will tell you about Evan is he is a man of family. His father, his grandfather, his uncle served in the Air Force and so when he was asked to go to Iraq and serve his country a little bit, work on the rule of law, he did not hesitate, much to my chagrin, who was still back here. And he did it because he knows if people don't stand up for freedom, who will? It was his job, his honor, and his privilege to go and help talk about the rule of law. And thank you, that was the one thing he asked me to do, is thank you for being here participating in your democracy. This isn't any politician's democracy, it's your democracy and it's your job to judge it and to, to be there to protect it. The final reason I would say is freedom. Being a judge is not about wearing a cape or being a king, as you'll hear from Evan soon. Being a judge is about being humble and serving your people and saying exactly what the law is. You don't get to make the law up. And I promise you, Justice Scalia would come back to haunt Evan if he ever tried to get ahead of himself and do something like that. He understands the rule of law. He understands humility. He's worked every day of his life to learn about it, to study it. He was a Marshall Scholar. He wrote about this years ago. He was number one at Yale Law School, and he hurried back home to Texas where the same live and where he could be amongst his people. So these and many, many more reasons are why I would ask you to consider Evan, to consider letting him continue to serve in this amazing honor and opportunity. Texas is the 10th largest economy in the world. We deserve a Supreme Court that's as good as the US Supreme Court. We all heard, we all saw what President Trump did in looking at his candidates for the U.S. Supreme Court. We deserve that here in Texas as well. We deserve to protect business. We deserve to protect you. Evan has trained to do that his whole life. And I am so proud to introduce my husband, my love, and a man who I know will serve you every single day. So thank you. Good evening, my name is Evan Young, and I'm a justice on the Texas Supreme Court. I'm on the ballot to keep my seat, and I'm delighted to be able to talk with you by video. I look forward to meeting all of you in person in the coming weeks and months and years. My sister and brother-in-law live in Collin County over in Prosper, and more importantly, my three nephews, who are my little girl's only cousins, live there. So I'll be around, and I look forward to many chances to meet with you. In my absence, my wife Toby and my brother-in-law Brian are with you tonight. I hope that you'll visit with them and let them tell you a little bit more about me. And please visit my website too. It's justiceevanyoung.com. All of you who are here tonight are taking your civic duty seriously. In Texas, the people have an absolute right to choose our judges. But not very many of our fellow citizens get to know very much about the judges for whom we must vote. So I'm so appreciative that you are here so that you can exercise your civic responsibility wisely. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. 
I'm an Air Force kid whose dad was able to settle our family here in Texas about 30 years ago. He himself grew up in an Air Force family, and he lived in Texas as a kid. He wanted this state to be where his children grew up, and it's where I want my daughter, and I hope my future grandchildren, to grow up. When Governor Abbott had a chance to choose a justice recently, he had a broad range of choices. Governor Abbott was himself a Texas Supreme Court justice, and he knows how the court works and what it takes to be an excellent justice. I'm very grateful that he picked me for this important job. I believe that part of why he picked me was because he knew that I am committed to the same method of judicial decision making that my old boss, Justice Antonin Scalia, always followed. Justice Scalia was a great American and a great justice. He loved our state, and it's an amazing thing that he spent his last day on this earth in Texas. He was a faithful and principled justice who made it his life's work try to convince the legal community and the American people that judges are not kings. Judges are not there to impose their policy preferences on their fellow citizens. Judges have only one legitimate role, and that is to serve the public by using lawyerly skills to accurately, faithfully, clearly, and precisely say what legal documents mean. Maybe the Constitution or a statute or a will, or a contract. Ultimately, all that a judge has the authority to do is to tell us what those texts actually mean. And if the people don't like the law as it is, it's up to the people, not to the judges, to change the law. Too many judges, especially in Washington, D.C., have confused what their role is. They think that our fellow citizens need judges to tell them how to live their lives. Justice Scalia always rejected the temptation to be the ruler of his fellow citizens. He knew that changing and updating the law is a job for the people and their representatives and never a job for judges. Justice Scalia's methodology is what ensured that he could not stray from the rightful role of a judge. He could hold himself accountable, his colleagues could hold him accountable, and anyone who read his opinions could tell if he was being consistent and reliable. I pledge to the people of Texas that for as long as you allow me to serve you on your Supreme Court, I also will decide every single case exactly that same way. I will jealously guard the rights of the people to govern themselves. And as a Texas Supreme Court Justice, I will make sure that no court in this entire state usurps the power of our people. That is the very definition of the rule of law, and I will spend my life defending it. I lived in places where the rule of law is in short supply. I spent about a year in Iraq during the surge in 2007 2008. And one of my jobs there was to spend hours every single week with the Chief Justice of Iraq, a wonderful man named Medhat al mahmoud he sought to bring the blessings of the rule of law to his people. I'd often see him walking hand in hand with a small boy in the green zone of Baghdad, who was his little grandson. Just those two generations, though, because the year before I got to Baghdad, a terrorist cell captured and murdered the Chief Justice's only son and dumped his body in the street to try to intimidate the father. The Chief Justice was heartbroken, as any of us would be but he did not give up or give in. The rule of law, I can tell you, is fragile. We can never assume that it will be there for the next generation just because it was there for us. We must protect it and strengthen it, always. I want it to be there for my little girl and for your children and grandchildren too. And that is why I want to stay as your Supreme Court Justice. And why I hope that I can earn your vote and make you proud that you voted for me. I promise you, that I will never stop working, never stop trying, and never quit believing in the Constitution of the United States and of Texas. God bless you, and may God bless Texas, and good night. I'd like to thank Toby Young and Jim Pickle for the representation two rep fine representatives for two fine candidates. Thank you very much.
Okay, we're going to wrap this up here real quickly. Uh, I want to tell you, first of all, that I think we accomplished our purpose here tonight. Our purpose was to give you an opportunity to see the, the uh, candidates up front and their opinions, their thoughts, uh, and their suggestions on how they would like to move us forward. I thought the candidates were excellent, and we have a tough choice in our hands, trying to look at the uh, amount, amazing amount of talent that we saw here this evening, and then pick the right person. But you have uh, once again honored us with your presence tonight. Forgot all about the football game. Somebody else will worry about that. You're here, and you've learned, and that's what we're all about. Uh, also, I want to tell you that you get to hear more about these candidates because out in the foyer, they have their table set up. So if any particular candidate has some questions, or you had some questions or thoughts, you can see them personally, get their literature, and, and, and get a little closer understanding of what they are, or who they are. Okay, next thing. Uh, next thing is, uh, I, I've got to make sure and say these badges. So these badges are all important to us. If you would take them off and set them on the table, so all we ask you to do is to set them all on the table in front of you. We'll pick them all up. So I thank you for that. Now, we have a lot more candidates to visit and to, and to introduce you to. And so I want to talk a little bit about the, what we're going to be doing in the next couple of weeks. We can't do or introduce all the candidates to you that are running uh, uh, before the March 1st election unless we have two more sessions. One will be on January 24th. It will not be a dinner session. It will be an open seating session, but we are gonna to have to have your reservation because we gotta have some idea of the size crowd that we're getting. So you'll be asked to give us your reservation. It'll be open seating, what is commonly referred to as airplane type seating. The only thing that will be open that night is the bar. So be sure and get uh, a good meal before you come, okay? All right, uh, so that's Monday, January 24th. These are the speakers that we will have. For Attorney General, George P. Bush, Louis Gomer, Eva Guzman, Ken Paxton, and uh, who is the incumbent. The District Clerk, Clerk Lynn Finley, Debbie Lytle, uh, Laura Jinks, uh, Trahulia Jinks, and Mike Gold. And the constable will be Matt Carpenter, Kobe Owen, Chris Trevino, and Ricky Burns. So you'll get to meet all of that, those people. You'll get to get their views, just like you got the views tonight from the folks that you met. Okay? All right. I think we, we've got one more piece, right? Oh, the third, the third candidate forum will be Monday. Uh, will not be Monday, January 3rd, it'll be February the 15th, okay? All right, uh, so the last thing, I want to thank you for attending. Once again, please leave your name badges at the table. We have a lot of work to do. Our goal is very simple. Make sure that you get to see all the candidates so you make a wise choice. Thank you for coming tonight. We certainly appreciate your attendance.